Well, I think there are several things at work here, Bev. One is that uh, they're putting a lot of resources into counterterrorism and they're having success. Uh, counterterrorism intelligence has been very effective. We see it through police, but it's a whole of government operation at detecting and disrupting. So what that means is that uh, ambitious, large-scale plots are generally detected. People start communicating, they're found out and they're stopped. It doesn't stop lone actor attacks. But they tend to be smaller. Not always, of course. Remember Christchurch 2019. So that's the first thing. The second thing is any kind of uh, risk level, alert level, is only effective if it moves in response to circumstances. If you, if you don't move it, you stop paying attention. If your, if your kitchen smoke alarm keeps beeping every day, you start to ignore it. Um, the old adage about the boy crying wolf, and we, we ignore threats that are made repeatedly, and we see nothing happening. So ASIO is hard at work, and they are stopping uh, bad things happening, but the public needs to sort of take a step back and be assured that they'll let us know when they have a particular problem. Yeah. They do still warn, though, that there could be a deadly attack. So what necessarily should we be aware of as to where things are shifting? Well, what ASIO has told us, that we go back half a dozen years and 10% of the counterterrorism work was on far-right extremism. Now more than half of their work is far-right extremism. That's more likely to manifest as it did in Christchurch with a lone actor attack. And as in the case of Christchurch, it can be very large scale, uh, but it probably will be smaller scale. So they're saying we, we can't keep this elevated level going indefinitely because it's counterproductive, but we want to drop it back now so that if we have a particular concern, we can raise it and people will pay attention. Uh, their concern, as they say, is about these lone actor attacks. So they've had, you know, something like 30 odd uh, attacks or attempted attacks uh, since uh, since the Islamic State Caliphate in 2014, when the level was raised to, to probable. Um, and that's not going to suddenly go away. It's just that things are under control. The counterterrorism intelligence piece is working and that, that is good news, but this is a very resilient threat. Yeah, and with that counter uh, in intelligence, it, it's it's working further afield, isn't it as well? Not just here, you talk about New Zealand, you're looking at Indonesia, there is work being done and also cooperation among many nations to counter some of this. That's right, I mean, for example, you know, one of the most sig significant plots that was thwarted was that plot to blow up an Etihad aircraft out of Sydney. And in fact, the explosive devices were, was mailed by Turkish Air to Sydney. Uh, it was picked up by Israeli agents in the field, picking up signals intelligence in Syria, and, and they alerted authorities back through the chain. And that's a good example of how this is, you know, really an international exercise in cooperation. And of course, a lot of our focus is on Southeast Asia. We work very well with the Indonesians, and, and a lot more of our work will be done there offshore, but it's of concern to us, and it may affect Australians. Mm. It seems too, though, Greg, that there is a much more silent threat that could be a little bit more insidious, and this is foreign interference, which is far more covert, covert, but can be very, very damaging. Yeah, it can be very damaging, Bev, partly because we just don't realise how bad it is at two levels. We don't realise what influence is going on. And secondly, we don't realise what intelligence and what capacity is being picked up. Uh, the biggest concern, to be frank, at the moment is what would happen if you know, things really turned to custard with China, if there was action across the Taiwan Straits, how effective would Chinese uh, cyber operations be? They're not going to tell us until they have to use it. We hope they'll never have to use it. Um, but that's the nature of the uncertainty. They're developing, as other nation states do, but China's the particular concern here, the capacity to interrupt and Short of war, uh, the actions will be done with plausible deniability. So it may look like an accident. It's often hard to pin down. But in times of war, we don't know what capacity can be brought to bear. And that's the real concern. Yeah. I guess, therefore, very important that we're starting to see an easing and a thawing in relations between um, our two leaders. That's right. It's the other side of the coin. I mean, we, we want to be prepared um, for aspects of war, partly as a deterrence, but we also want to work hard on diplomacy because you can't do one or the other. I mean, uh, this is not about talking up a threat just to, to make people panic. Uh, it's about taking things seriously so we invest extra hard on the diplomatic people-to-people -people relations side. And hopefully that'll give us a better future for everyone, for the Chinese and for us. And I think there's good reasons to be confident there. The thawing of relations are a very good sign. Um, but we're, you know, this is serious business, so we have to take a sophisticated view that re recognises all aspects of risk. 
Uh, Greg, away from Australia, uh, you know, what do you see emerging in terms of terrorism? And we spoke to somebody about those awful attacks on the gay club um, in the United States, and she made the point that that should be seen as a terror attack. You know, is terrorism coming in different forms in different countries? Look, it's certainly being driven by different expressions, different motivations, and it's being driven and played out by different opportunities to execute an attack. So lone actor attacks are increasingly the problem. They're hard to detect and hard to thwart. And as we saw with Christchurch, you know, one Australian terrorist killed 51 people in cold blood. That could be a very major attack. Yes, that uh, nightclub attack, like many others we've seen, uh, we could call it a hate crime. It certainly was that. But we need to recognise that hate crimes can become terrorist crimes. That's what happened in Christchurch. A hateful extremist became a violent extremist. And it's complicated because it's no longer somebody acting in the name of, you know, Al-Qaeda, Islamic State. Often they're acting only in their own name, posting their own manifesto, but it's a pastiche of ideas from all sorts of far right and conspiracy theory groups. And that just makes it so much more complicated. So when ASIO talks about ideologically motivated terrorism, they're not just playing with language. It reflects a complex reality. Yeah, indeed. Greg, always get uh, good to get your insights on these things. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bev.